Today on Lockdown Red Wings, we're going to discuss the fate of Jeff Blaschel. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. Scotty, of course, also hosts at Locked On Tigers. Thanks for making us your first listen every single day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Make sure if you want to check out all the neat visuals we put on the screen, like the hockey heat map and the hockey stat card, the impact cards, head on over to YouTube. We try to do a, a pretty good description, Scotty, as best we can for those who are listening on Spotify and Apple, but nothing beats just seeing it on the screen. Yeah, no, it's YouTube's the best, man. We just got over there on Tigers too, so yeah. it's it's uh, it's it's a really awesome, especially like mid season, you know, when games are being played to be able to show visuals and stuff. It's it's, it's the bee's knees, as the kids say. <laughs> it probably be even better, Scotty, though, if the team is winning in the middle of the season as well. That would help. Something that the help. Uh, Red Wings have not been doing a whole lot of recently. And that has led us to this conversation. We kind of touched on it yesterday, Scotty, because how could we not? It it was kind of pertinent to discuss Jeff Blaschel with the two back-to-back losses and the 11-2 loss the Red Wings had faced the first time in, like I believe it was 19 years, a team and any of anywhere in the NHL has lost and given up 11 goals in a game. And it's time we guess we we got it we got to bite the bullet on this one. Earlier in the season I had said you know, keep Blashell around, the team's playing better. I think the team responds to him, the locker room hasn't given up on him. You know, I was hardcore like defending him. Uh Yeah, my tune has changed. And it's been a, over a month now of just piss poor for performances by the Detroit Red Wings and Scotty. I think it's time to say that I can fully admit Jeff Blaschel is a temporary coach on this hockey team and needs to be gone probably sooner rather than later. Yeah. I, I So, <laughs> I mean, I'll start with this. He is, he's not, he's not going anywhere before the season ends, dog. Like all these people are like, I, I'm shocked Jeff Blaschel is still the head coach of the Detroit Red Wings after that horrible performance against the Penguins. Like whatever he's, they, they could lose every game the rest of the year by 10. He's not going anywhere before game 82. It's not happening. Um, Mostly because there's no point. No matter how bad of a head coach you think he is, there is no head coach on the market currently. And you're like, oh, we really got to get ahead of everybody and, and, and you know, can Blaschel so that we can get so-and-so who's out there. Uh, that's not, like, not the case. That, that's not how... The, the head coach market is not heating up three quarters of the way through the season. So like it, it's not going to happen. Um, so you're going to have to tough it out. And that's just how on it, like just how sports work, honestly, like you don't see, it, you'll see people get traded the beginning part of the season. If someone starts out slow, you might even see somebody get traded in the middle of the season. Nobody get traded, cut, whatever. Nobody gets, relieved of their head coaching duties you know a month before the season ends that's just not how this works so you can can that mythical you know (laughs) fairy tale in your head right off the rip um but that being said he's still got a year left on his deal and uh i don't think that he will be behind the bench on game one of the 2022-23 season yeah so logically i agree with everything you just said I, I do also also understand and to some degree agree with what a lot of people are saying online with the the how outraged they are. It is true. There are a lot of lot of times where a team plays as poor as Red Wings played on Sunday, especially on a stretch that they're playing on, and a coach would get canned for that. And rightfully so. I mean, since the the home and home against the Philadelphia Flyers, the wheels have fallen off. February 14th. On Valentine's Day, the team played Minnesota in Minnesota, and they lost seven to four. That's where I like to say the start of the wheels falling off, so to speak, so to speak, start. Because after that, they won on the road. Grice played amazing in New York, but
but then lost five to two to the Avalanche, lost ten to seven to Toronto. They beat the Hurricanes in overtime. They lost to Tampa Bay. They gave up six to Florida, nine to Arizona, six to Minnesota again. Shut out three to nothing in Calgary. Lost seven to five in Edmonton. Shut out the Vancouver Canucks. Lost four to two. You go down the list. You go down the list. You go down the list. You finish on eleven to two loss to the Pittsburgh Penguins. <laughs> so it's not just a Pittsburgh Penguins loss of eleven to two. It's not. That's not the outlier. I mean, giving up eleven goals, I guess, could be considered an outlier. But you've given up ten goals in the season. You've given up nine goals in the season. You've given up eight goals in the season. It's not a one-time thing. So to say that people are out of line, not saying you were, but I, I'm definitely not going to say people were out of line for calling for Jeff Blaschel's head because I, I'm going to admit it. Last night at, or after Sunday's game, I was in the same mindset. I was like, this is it. It's It's got to be done. He's got to be gone. And this is coming from a guy who, you know, after the improvements we saw from the team this season was like, hey, you know, maybe Eisenman made the right decision keeping him around. And maybe Eisenman did make the right decision in keeping him around, too. That argument is there, too. And that's probably why he's going to be behind the bench until the end of Game 82, because the team's not ready to compete again. And you've made this argument before, Scotty, too, where you say he's a great transitional coach. He's not the coach for when, and he was, I mean, he was the coach when they're tanking. So I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I apologize if I'm doing that. But he, he was the coach while they were tanking. And he's the coach through the rebuild. But when this team's ready to compete, then they get a new coach. And maybe Eisenman signed him to the extension because the team just isn't ready to compete yet. And maybe that's the reality that we have to we have to face. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it, first off, I my my it's not gonna happen was not that it's not justified or deserved. It just doesn't make oh, yeah. really any any logical sense at the moment like I, I want him gone too but it's just it, we need to can the the crazy hypothetical that it's going to happen in the last month of a season and um but the the interesting thing is yes that has been my argument throughout really his entire tenure uh nolan and i had this conversation probably a year ago about uh, oh you know is, is should blashell come back and you know it was before the extension and we had a conversation about it and um my whole thing was always that it was always when have you ever seen in any sport a head coach manager whatever be the head coach at at, at the start of the rebuild like before they even started trading people away like like the team's a, a playoff team still playoff team I mean, they made it. They made the playoffs, and, right? <laughs> and then, and then trade, like start the rebuild and trade everyone away, be horrible, then build them back up, and then still be the head coach slash manager slash whatever sport when they they make the playoffs again. When have you ever seen that? It doesn't happen, and. We, we like to think as Red Wings fans that we are kind of outliers to some rules. This is not one of them. Uh, and it's, it's so rare that I'm not even sure I can really remember a, a, a relatively modern time in which it, it, it even has happened in any sport. Uh, just going through playoff, full rebuild, competitive again is just unheard of. And I, I think that he was a fine guy to to carry the bridge like red wings fan you know through the system whatever you know had a couple of playoff berths early on in the time a colder championship right he, he's a he's a fine fine guy to to have in as as the you know the man behind the bench when uh when we're losing a lot and and we were always going to lose a lot but i i think it's I mean, we'll get into the rest of the episode. We'll talk about why, but I, I think it's it's pretty uh, at this point hard to defend him and and say that he is the guy that is going to be behind the bench when we're making cup runs again. Yeah, and and we're going to continue to talk about this too um, through segments segments two and three. I think this whole this this whole discussion deserves a whole episode just to itself because this is, this has been coming for a while now. For over a month, we've been brewing on these feelings and we've been holding off, holding off. And here we are now. Uh, but first 
want to talk to you guys today about betonline.net. After months of playing, college basketball has determined the top teams for the final four and will determine this year's national champion this coming week. Scotty, that's insane. This coming week. This coming week. This coming week. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it, BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. BetOnline. Where the game starts. So before we had that little ad read there, Scotty, a little, little, little bit of ad read, um, I wanted to mention that it, when talking about the Blashville situation, I do think, and you know, we are on the same page here that, yes, the Red Wings need to move on from him. Win is still up, for, up in the air, but the agreement is there. But I do think it, you have to play devil's advocate, and you have to also be fair to some degree and recognize that he took over a Red Wings team that was aging and falling apart. So to blame, and I see a lot of this blame going around on social media, to blame the downward trajectory this team has taken all on him, I think is a little bit unwarranted just from the degree that this, th- this team was built to fail for several years. Now, the caveat to that is this year was the litmus test. This year was meant to be the year that they took a step forward, a legitimate step forward towards competitiveness. And for the most part, and we had many episodes on it throughout the season, and for the most part, they did. But this last week has shown, this last week, this last month has shown, Scotty, that it's not because of Jeff Blaschel, but more of in spite of Jeff Blaschel. Jeff Blaschel, but more specifically because of three goddamn good rookies and Dylan Larkin. And I mentioned it on yesterday's episode. How many games have we literally won because of those players? Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, right? Um, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I, I, th- I think both can be true, right? I, I, I think that you can very much have uh, the downward trajectory of the team be for reasons that are directly related to the way Jeff Blashill coaches and realize that the defense is so bad, it doesn't matter who would be behind the bench, this team would still struggle. There's a difference between, oh man, like we're losing a lot of games five to three, six to three, even versus like, hey, in the la- in the last fourteen games, we've we've given up nine or more three times. Like there's a there's a difference between those two things. Um so, yes, I, I think that both can be true. And I, I think a lot of it, and we talked about it on yesterday's show, but but a lot of the the stuff that you can't hide from and, and it's really hard to defend, period, is the... Not that this is the only instance of this, but, like, why is Jacob Verona playing a third line? <laughs> like, why Why does that make sense? Why is he getting third-line minutes and he's not on the top line of your power play? Especially when you have as many injuries as the Red Wings have in their top six. It just it, it just doesn't make sense. And like I said, that's one of, of many instances throughout not only this season but his entire tenure, honestly. Where there's been some questions about how he makes his lines. And, you know, b- before not as much this year, honestly, but before this year there was a lot of mixing and matching lines in the middle of games and and all this just honestly nonsense. And I, I think that it has come to a point this year where you can distinctly see it because we actually have some talent, right? You, we actually have some talent where if they are put in the right situations and you do see a decently coached game, you can tell and they can win some of those games. And this is the first time in, in what, maybe half a decade that that's been the case for a, a blashill led team. So it's it's just – it's it's ob- painfully obvious for the first time in a long time. Well, and also not to mention, too, and, and we tend to forget about it now because it's been a, been a little bit, but the insistence on how long Danny DeKaiser is playing top pair minutes with Moritz Sider when now he's not even playing in the NHL. I mean, he's on the IR um, – but I mean, how quickly was he waived? 
put on the IR, but still practicing, mind you. He's still practicing with the team. So how quickly we went from Danny DeKaiser top pair to him not even playing at the NHL level at this point. And we were saying all season long, why is he playing top pair? Why is he playing top pair? Top pair? So there's been head-scratching question marks all the way through this entire tenure of Jeff Blaschel. And it's, 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 it's like you said, it's accentuated this season just by the fact that you got have guys like Jacob Verona playing third line. You had guys like Danny Kaiser playing, you know, top line minutes. You had Adam Ernie playing second line. We've had Michael Rasmussen playing top line. Last year, you could make the argument Michael Rasmussen had to play the top line because so many of our top six forwards, like Larkin and Bertuzzi, were injured. This year, why was Rasmussen playing top line minutes when Verona's available? When even hell, Zadine is available. And that's not a shot of Michael Rasmussen, but that's above his depth. That's not where his his ty- style of play is usually utilized or should be utilized. So why is he playing? Why is Oscar Swinquist, who's been historically a bottom six forward, playing top six forward minutes? And I, I understand Robbie Fabry's injured. I understand that he's got a torn ACL. But those aren't your only options. So you got those question marks that just continue to plague the team. And then on top of that, you just got the team having historically bad numbers. Prashanth Iyer, as, as everyone, great Twitter follow. Make sure you go on Twitter, follow me the at Twitter follow if the you're a Twitter fan. follow if you're an analytically minded Red Wings fan. It says worst goals against per game last 25 years. Number one, the 1999-2000 Atlanta uh, Thrashers team. Rest in peace, the Atlanta Thrashers. Uh, Three point eight. Follow on Twitter as well, by the way. Yes, the the Atlanta Thrashers. <laughs> the Atlanta Thrashers. The guy actually used to work for like an NHL like oh, social media. Like, yeah, he had a whole Q&A thing. Like, he used to run NHL team social medias. And then that. now he runs the the faux Atlanta Thrashers. And it's a must-follow if you're a hockey fan as well. That's fantastic. I didn't know that. Now, I, that's funny. That adds, like, an extra layer of humor to it to me. Yeah, he's hysterical. Um, So, number one was the Atlanta Thrashers. Number two, this season's Detroit Red Wings team at 3.80. 3.80 goals a game this season for the second worst in the last 25 years. Number five is the 1920 Detroit Red Wings at 3.73. So two of those teams, two of those Red Wings teams under Jeff Blaschel's tenure are in the worst goals against per game in the last 25 years. Now, the 1920 team was the year we tanked the hardest for Alexis Lafreniere and ended up with Lucas Raymond. God bless. That ended up being really good. But that speaks more to how bad this season is with better talent with how well this team was playing in the first three quarters of the season, two thirds of the season, whatever you want to say, when we have a worse goals against per game in the year, we legitimately attempted to tank for the number one overall pick. And we're one of the worst hockey teams in, I mean, the, like the history of ever. Yeah. Like I'm pace ridiculous. to be legitimately one of the worst teams of all time. And then how about this one, Scott? I got another one for you. Great. Prashant, Prashant was popping off. Most games allowing seven plus goals against in a season last 25 years. Number one, this season's Detroit Red Wings with nine games giving up seven plus goals or more. We have given up more seven plus goals a game than any other team in the last 25 years. This season, the year the Red Wings took a step forward, but the defensive side of the team, which has supposedly they shored up last year, and that's why Larkin's scoring and Zena's scoring was so bad. Because the D, their defensive side of their game was taking a step forward, is defensively worse than it's ever been in Jeff Blaschel's tenure. So, do you think that, like, it, it's just all like the rookies and the top six that kind of stepped up, and that was just like, hey, we were ready to take this step forward, and Blaschel is kind of like, I don't want to say holding back, but maybe limiting how how big of a step forward they could have taken this season. I don't even want to, I don't necessarily want to say that um, because Jeff Blaschel did, he was a big proponent to actually getting more excited on the team last year. Eisenman said, no, because like, no, we're still rebuilding. That's going to ruin our draft position because this guy's a game changer. And he was right. So, so th- there's credit to be had there. He's put more insider and Lucas Raymond in positions to succeed, putting them on top line, getting more inside side of the most minutes on the team as a 20 year old rookie. And Lucas Raymond is happy birthday, a 20 year old rookie now. Also 20 years old. Happy birthday. Uh, it's his dog. birthday on Monday. Um, so I think what happened was the success and the step forward we saw this season wasn't necessarily the team taking a step forward, but these rookies having a massive impact. And now that they're 
you know, hot streaks, not to say they're not good anymore because they're still very talented hockey players. They started off the season on a tear. And they, like I said at the beginning of the episode, they and Delkovich and Larkin literally won us games. Once their hot streaks kind of ended and they found their level of just very good, you saw how shallow the team was. And you saw that it wasn't the team taking a step forward, but four players overperforming. And, you know, now that this they, they're not overperforming anymore, still performing at a good level, but not overperforming anymore, Jeff Blaschel has been exposed. Sure. Fair enough. I, I think that's a decent way to put it. The, I, I guess my, my biggest thing was just, is it, is it, could this season have been a lot different? And I, because we all admit that this season was a big step forward. Everybody admits that the right, that mm-hmm. this season was a huge step in the right direction, even with, the last month included. I mean, if, if you would have told anybody before opening night, the exact record and, and the production we've been getting out of all the players, the rookies and Larkin specifically, everybody would take that in a heartbeat. I mean, you know, it seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago that, that uh, we were talking about this type of season being a successful season. So I guess my biggest thing is it was just asking if, it's the depths of the badness that is the biggest problem, or if it's more of the other way of, you know, we could have taken an even bigger step forward, or if it's a little bit of both. Uh, Cop-out answer, but probably a little bit of both, and I'll explain why. But first, I got to talk to you guys today about rockauto.com. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible uh, for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you ever need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain auto chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. To have everything you could need, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even a new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck right locked down on there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts you will ever need. rockauto.com. Hey, Scotty. Hey, Brian. (laughs) Can you... Ask me your question again because reading the ad, I forgot what you asked me, and I know I teased my answer, but I can't even remember now. Uh, no, I'm, so I, I was just asking if if the biggest reason for everybody kind of universally coming together on Blashill isn't the head coach next year, if it was uh, more to do with how bad the the bottoming out was, like how bad the bad is, because clearly when it's bad, it's freaking bad or if it's more to do with the op the opposite end which is uh the high the the ceiling could have been higher or is it a little bit of both um a little bit of both but if i had to if i had to if i had to lean one more away i would say that the bad is just so much worse than the good i think we've seen some incredible highs so this if season. we had the exact same record but all of those games where we gave up, let's say every game where we gave up six or more goals, we have the exact same record, but that those anything above six is taken away. Is our opinion of Blashill different? Yeah, I would think so. I, I would think without these embarrassing, like you expect this team's not complete yet. And we know that. So you expect a higher amount of losses still than wins. I, I think even when we were talking about making the playoffs at one point, it was more so not, we were even talking about like maybe they could squeak in if they could just continue to play at this incredibly high rate. So you expect losses to some degree, you know, you expect to lose these games against, you know, Tampa Bay and expect to lose these games to Pittsburgh, but you don't expect to give up 11 goals to Pittsburgh. You don't expect to give up seven goals to Toronto. You don't expect to give up 10 goals to Toronto. You know, that it's, it's the, these horrible losses where the team comes out flat and then it just never recovers after having a good game against a good team the night before that just speaks way more about where this team is at rather than the games where the players are playing out of their minds. And we, like I said, we've seen some incredible highs and I think we're going to get more of those highs 
as it comes. And that's where we say we see the step forward. Like we see what these young guys are, ta- how talented they are and what they can do. But when you see these these games where the entire team comes out and not ready to play and they give up 11 goals against, you, it, that I think speaks more to the coaching than the games where you squeak out an overtime win against the Carolina Hurricanes. You know what I mean? Sure. I I think in the way that I asked the question, I think that same record, same everything, just goals against per game capped out at six. I I think I don't think it changes everybody's opinion of Blash. I think people are maybe it's not as loud and it's not as, you know, rioty and, and pitchforky but like it's I, I think that it's I think that that opinion would still remain and I, I think that people were already kind of getting close to the end with him I and mean people I, have been there for a couple years <laughs> right like pe- people were already not super pumped about the extension as is now there are a lot more defenders back then as well but I mean it, it was already not a universally loved extension as as, as it already stood and um, I think that if our record was our record and, and we even lose all the games like that we actually lost the, you know, it's, it's, it's not only were they all like, did we have the sprinkled in nine plus gold against game, but there were some streaks in there, man, like, yeah. like rough streaks and, and like six goals against is still a hell of a lot. It is. And, no. And you can still have a pretty, pretty horrible uh, defensive numbers with, with that. So I, I think, I think it's less intense maybe. And like I said, a little less like pitchforky, but I, I still think that, that people are, are pretty much done, man. I think, I think people are pretty, I think it would have taken like a 500 or better season to change anybody's opinion. So- I, I think with, the record as it stands and the trajectory we're headed. Uh, I don't, I don't really think while, while it's bad and I acknowledge that it's bad. I don't really think that like the tipping point is, Oh, but we gave up 10 sometimes. I think it's a, a much broader body of work for a lot of people. Yeah. The, that's giving up 10 sometimes is like the salt in the wound. Like it's, you already got a gash exactly. going on and it's like, exactly. Oh, now you could like, you're leaving no doubt. Um, so the question I have, I guess we can end off on this, and I, I, I want to ask you this, Scotty. You're weighing the pros and the cons of coaching, firing him, and you've already made your statement. You think end of the season, then fire him. But the pros and the cons, to you have to always think of one player development of players on the team already, and also the long-term plans of this team. So obviously, Eisenman signed him to a two-year extension. So the intent in mind when you sign somebody to an extension is to have them play, fulfill that contract. But with how this season is ending and how brutally awful this season is ending, you would think that he doesn't make it past this season. But is a coaching change waiting and not sorry? Is coaching change at the end of the season not having fulfilled next year really the best choice in terms of the long term plans? Do you keep a coach like Blashill around another season to get another high draft pick, or on the other end? There have been teams that have met, and you made your argument already about not firing a coach three quarters of the way through the season, and I agree with that. But playing devil's advocate, there can be an argument to be made that firing a coach at any given point can revitalize a team, and we're not competing for a playoff spot. But you saw it with the Oilers, and you saw it with the Vancouver Canucks. They fired their coach, brought in. They, they just spun the wheel of the, th- the hundreds of head coaches that just keep getting new jobs in the NHL, and the Canucks landed on a right. Boudreau. And the, both those teams are playing fantastic right now. Or much better, much improved. Where yeah. do you fly with Blashell? Where's the where where's the sweet spot? Uh, unless you only do it if you're bringing in the guy that is going to be the coach of the future. That's the sweet spot. You don't bring somebody in for a month and then change the coach again for these guys in in a month and a half when the season ends. That's preposterous, and that's why he's not going to get fired. But if you the guy you are bringing in to replace him is the guy and is the guy that everyone in, in that front office is a hundred percent convinced this is our head coach for the next three, four, five years. Sure. Go right ahead. The earlier, the better you bring that guy in. Absolutely. I, I have no issue with that. I have a huge issue 
with changing head coaches every four weeks. So, uh, yes, if the sweet spot is, I guess, the the long-term opinion of whoever you, whomever you are bringing in. That is the, the sweet spot, and that is the question. If it's the long-term guy, then do it today. Do it right now. Do it before we throw this episode up. Great. <laughs> but if if it's, oh, we the just interim. want a placeholder, there's no point in placeholdering someone else when you have a, a guy that, like him or not, he's been a lot of these dudes' coaches their entire re- – well, he's been all of their coaches for their entire Red Wings tenures – and, and several other coaches for, for most of their NHL tenures. Well, and also, too, and I made the point just because teams have done it and it, it, it is an option, but I agree with you. It would make no sense to fire Blashill now at this point with 15 games left because what do you gain by doing that? If the team gets revitalized, it made sense for the Oilers and the Canucks because they were trying to make the playoffs. Correct. And now, at least the Oilers quite possibly will, probably will. Because they have a coach who's utilizing their players better. Red Wings aren't in that position. So getting a new coach in who's going to make your team play better is going to ruin your draft position. I know that's a, a cold business business style mentality to have, but that's the reality of the league. At this point, they're out of the playoffs. You want the best draft pick available to make your team better in the long term. And firing Jeff Lashell now doesn't achieve that. It's gonna So it's going to be a brutal last 15 games. Now, I agree with you. If they can find their coach of the future in this offseason – Definitely pull the trigger, but there's no coach right now in the current, you know, cycle of all the coaches that keep getting new jobs that I want. There is right, and that's why you have to wait till the off season so that yeah. everybody in across all the different leagues on the planet can be on an off season together. And me and Igor Larionov, cool. let's go. People want it. Why not? <laughs> Just try. But see, and I say that half jokingly, but John Cooper of the Tampa Bay Lightning was plucked out of, you know, I think USHL. He wasn't an NHL head coach. You know, uh, Jeff Blaschel was, he was a coach that is the only NHL team he's been with. So it's hit and miss, but I'd rather take a chance on a guy that is unproven than go with one of these mediocre head coaches that you can survive on for five years, not win anything and then move on from. Correct. I agree. That's a conversation for a whole nother day, honestly. Yeah. Well, but, well yes. I have to do some research on coaches available. Um, Man, I think uh, I think I got. I think think I vented thoroughly. I think I'm feeling better now. Yeah, I think we got everything. Good. Um, any final thoughts? We ball. We absolutely ball. Uh, thanks for making Locked On Red Wings your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen to Locked On Fantasy Hockey. Host Steel Roden and Flip Livingstone help you become the expert of your fantasy league. It's free and available wherever you get your platforms. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. I uh, believe a episode preview. As we preview uh, one of the Red Wings' next hockey games, let me see who are they playing. Uh, oh boy, the New York Rangers! So that'll be fun. Uh, same time, same place. It's your team every day. Every day.